Hello and welcome to yet another presentation on literary criticism. This time, ekphrasis. First things first, I would like to apologize for the late upload, but hey, I'll make it up to you in the presentation. So what exactly are we dealing with today, you may ask? Two people and two works of art which you may or may not be familiar with, but you certainly will be after the presentation comes to an end. Today we're exploring how the lives of Anne Sexton and Vincent van Gogh intertwine, and how their shared values contributed to Sexton's rendition of Van Gogh's Starry Night, which is more of a suicide note to be honest. But before we get into these madlets, we must first understand what the word ekphrasis means, and where it comes from. Oh hey Homer, didn't see you there, I'll say hi. Anywho, as you can see the word ekphrasis derives from the Greek word ekphrasein, which is made up of the words ek and phrasis, meaning out and speak respectively. You don't really have to be a top-notch linguist to get that ekphrasis roughly translates to speaking out the name of something. According to the Poetry Foundation, an ekphrastic poem is a vivid description of a scene or more commonly a work of art, meaning that ekphrastic poetry works on the basis of transforming visual art to verbal. Just to give you a taste of this throughout the ages, let's check on some super hot poets who were spitting bars way before rapping was cool. Since the Greeks were the real OGs who invented ekphrasis, it comes as no surprise that your boy Homer used it in the Iliad as he described the shield of Achilles from how he first dismayed it to its completed shape. And since the Romans were big fans of the Greeks, they also incorporated ekphrasis into their own poetry to make it look cooler. Virgil, for example, described what Aeneas saw engraved on the doors of the Temple of Juno in Carthage, while his homie Catullus straight up wrote about a bedspread featuring the story of Ariadne in Catullus 64. Ekphrastic poetry became the real deal in the Romantic era, where poets such as John Keats obsessed over everything antiquity, such as uh, urns and stuff. A guy named Dante Gabriel Rossetti, whom you've probably never heard about, was also hustling his brains out in England as he tried to earn fat stacks of cash cash money by writing poems about paintings which he himself had produced. Fun fact, in the 19th century a certain Michael Field, who was no Michael and definitely not a Field, wrote an entire volume containing only acrostic poetry called Sight and Song in 1892. We conclude our little journey of ekphrasis with the works of two poets whom you might be familiar with, one being Rainer Maria Rilke, don't let the Maria don't fool let you, the Maria he was a guy with a pretty neat mustache, mustache. And you know him, you love him, the one and only William Carlos Williams, both known for their adoration of Greek torsos. Having covered that, let us move on to our first mad lad of today, Vincent van Gogh. Van Gogh was born on March 30th, 1853, in which is somewhere in the Netherlands, into a religious middle-class family. And after much traveling and various unfulfilling occupations, he decided to say f it all and took up painting with no training whatsoever. And while his works revolutionized the world of art, they were mainly a product of his struggle with depression and mental illnesses. But let me tell you, this guy was a workaholic. Van Gogh allegedly painted almost 900 paintings in a span of 10 years, which is not exactly surprising as he created 5 different versions of the sunflowers, hardly selling the first one. He was also a prolific correspondent as he wrote nearly 800 letters to his brother in his lifetime, talk about overkill. Despite him painting his heart out, Van Gogh was only able to sell one painting 7 months before his death. The Red Vineyard went for approximately 400 francs in Belgium. 1888 marks the year of the domestic dispute between Van Gogh and his left ear, which ultimately decided to stay, but they both agreed on the fact that the lobe of the ear had to go. Rumor has it that Van Gogh's friend and fellow painter Paul Gauguin severed Vincent's lobe while they were fencing on Christmas of 1888, but guess we'll never know. According to canon, Van Gogh decided to check into an asylum near saint remy de provence after a nervous breakdown in the same year him and the lobe of his ear parted. It was in this very asylum where he painted The Starry Night, which depicts the view from his bedroom window and which later inspired Anne Sexton to write sad girl poetry, but we'll get to that in a minute. Van Gogh eventually took his own life in the middle of a field in a place which I definitely cannot and will not pronounce to avoid butchering it completely or offending anyone. 
He died from a single gunshot to the chest with no witnesses and the gun was never found. Talk about going out in style, huh? Having mentioned Anne Sexton earlier, the original sad girl was born Anne Gray Harvey on November 9th, 1928 in Newton, Massachusetts. Having spent most of her life in Boston, she did lead the average life of a Bostonian, working for modeling agencies, finding a husband, getting married, having kids, being a feminist, joining a jazz rock group called Her Kind, you know, the usual stuff they do in Boston. But two things she was really good at were poetry and being sad. And by sad I mean really, really sad, not like the 21st century Billie Eilish I'm so sad girls. Sexton had been suffering from bipolar disorder for much of her life, with her first manic episode taking place just a year after giving birth to her first daughter. After having another episode, she met Dr. Martin Orne, who became her long-term therapist at the Glenside Hospital. Orne encouraged her to take up poetry as a hobby, little did he know that 12 years later, after her first sonnet, Anne Sexton would be among the most honored poets in the US, a Pulitzer Prize winner, a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, and the first female member of the Harvard chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. Feminism wins! Unfortunately, death became a central theme in her works, as her condition worsened. Her last works, The Death Notebooks and The Awful Rowing Toward God, the latter she wrote in 20 days, with two days out for despair and three days out in a mental hospital, both showed signs of her wanting to end it, which she eventually did. On returning home after having lunch with fellow poetess Maxine Kuhmin, she put on her mother's coat, removed all her rings, poured herself a glass of vodka, locked herself inside the garage, and started the engine of the car. Now that we know what our artists were all about, let us analyze Anne Sexton's and Van Gogh's Starry Night from an acrostic perspective. I'm going to give you a few minutes in order to familiarize yourselves with the poem, as I assume you have all seen the painting before. You may pause the recording. The Starry Night is a short free verse poem by Anne Sexton, where she identifies with Vincent Van Gogh, another tortured and suicidal artist. Sexton begins the poem with an epigraph from one of Van Gogh's letters to his brother. That does not keep me from having a terrible need of, shall I say the word, religion. That I go out at night and paint the stars. Sexton used epigraphs from a variety of works to begin her poems. These quotes are often of major importance, pointing to a main theme that might otherwise be overlooked. Here she confesses to sharing not only the mental imbalance, suicidal tendencies and artistic nature of Van Gogh, but also his unsatisfied desire for the spiritual. The oil painting depicts a dark tree, standing tall, being lonely and all, while in the middle we can see a distant town almost asleep. Sexton writes, the town does not exist in reference to it not catching the eye immediately, as in proportion to the sky and the large dark tree, it is quite small. In the background, the sky is burning with 11 stars, the exact number of stars on the original painting, and an orange moon contrasting against the blue and black of night. According to Sexton, the night boils, as the painting creates a sense of unrest, with the sleeping town beneath the sky unconscious of how all nature spirals towards infinity. She considers the whole painting as a metaphor for her longing after death. The dark tree at the edge of the painting is described as being black-haired, representing Sexton as it slips up like a drowned woman into the hot sky. The almost mantra-like refrain, which references the bravery of the lone tree, makes her meaning clearer as the sentence, this is how I want to die, echoes twice in the poem. In the next verse, Sexton expresses a longing for spirituality, which is represented by her comparing the moon to a great serpent. The serpent swallowing its own tail is a symbol for eternity and the cyclical nature of life. Sexton views death as a liberation from the burden of life, hence she desires to silently and painlessly become one with the infinite. The last verse is almost manifesto-like, which suggests that if she were to end it all, she would definitely go out on her own terms, like the tortured artists and poets whom she looked up to. No flag, no woman, no cry, oh fuck, that's the wrong verse. <clears throat> no flag, no belly, no cry. Which translates to her not dying for a cause, her refusing offspring, and her not going out as a victim. 
The lives of both Van Gogh and Sexton were definitely not easy due to mental illness and trauma, but it was something that created a connection which made the poems such as Starry Night possible in the first place. Sure, they were tortured souls, suicidal and mentally imbalanced, but they both found peace of mind in art. This mindset helped Sexton animate Van Gogh's painting by taking the strongest motives from it, taking them for a ride on the field train, and finally creating her own manifesto in the poem. In Starry Night we get an extended picture that goes way beyond the visual experience, toying with our feelings in a way only literature can, hence we find ourselves in a place where two great minds meet. And this, my friends, is what Ekphrasis is all about. Thank you for sticking with me on this presentation, I hope you're all doing well. Feel free to bombard me with questions, I will do my best to answer them as soon as possible. Stay home, stay safe. See you around, Space Cowboys.